You can't underestimate the importance of the kingdom of Israel in our hope. Brother Thomas, writing in Elpis Israel, wrote, The kingdom founded at the beginning of the ages, the kingdom of Israel, will be his peculiar treasure above them all. If then we would understand the things of the kingdom of God, we must never lose sight of Israel in connection with the kingdom. Indeed, without them, there is no kingdom of God. And so we start with that premise, that we need to have an understanding of the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom that was established by the kings of Israel. And we shall go back before them, when the, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and went into the land, that kingdom, as they came into the land, that is a blueprint of the kingdom which will come. For us to understand the kingdom, we need to study the nation of Israel. And so we shall start by going back to Genesis. Come with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 49. And Genesis chapter 49, you'll recall, is the chapter that records the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons. He says in verse 1, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. And we're interested, in the first instance this afternoon, with the blessing that he gave to Judah. Verse 8, Judah Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Of course, it's what his name means, isn't it? Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. You're going to be the king. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone on. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter... The prophecy goes, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. <coughs> Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ashes colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And so if we unpick that very briefly, we see that in the blessing given to Judah is one who will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see that the, the blessing given to Judah will be until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering... Now, that, that Hebrew word really means obedience. Unto him shall the obedience of the people be. And so we start with Shiloh. We start with this promise. And Shiloh means, if you look in uh, some margins, the, the revised version margin tells us that Shiloh means till he come to Shiloh, ha having the obedience of the people. Sh Shiloh means he whose right it is. So until Shiloh come, until he come whose right it is. And we note in verse 12 that one of the characteristics of this king will be that his eyes will be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Well, you only have those two Hebrew words used together, the idea of the, the, the wine and the milk, in two other occasions in Scripture. One is in Song of Solomon, which we won't go to. But later on, of course, we will go to Isaiah chapter 55. You remember the passage about the sure mercies of David. So here we've got a clue as to what this king will ultimately be about. It's a, it's a blessing, isn't it, of abundance. That his eyes will be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. And so the, the young men, the old men, as they came into Egypt, became, as Micah showed us, a nation. They multiplied abundantly. And several hundred years later, they were brought out of the land of Egypt, as Brother Mike has shown us. 
And they came to the wilderness and they journeyed, didn't they, for two years until they came to Kadesh Barnea. Now turn to Numbers, to Numbers chapter 13. Because Numbers chapter 13 is the record from which we should have seen Israel go into the land. It was set, it was the land of promise. And the Lord was ready to take them there. But this people lacked faith. And so despite the fact, and we know the story so well, right? Despite the fact the 12 spies went in, they came back. And they came back with an evil report, save two. Save two men of great faith. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. And Joshua, the son of Nun. And they try to persuade them. Despite the fact that the people have said, Numbers 13, verse 28. The people are strong that dwell in this land. The cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. We saw giants. We can't do this. We can't do it. It's too difficult. And so, Caleb, in the din that follows as the ten spies give their report as the people descend into chaos as any faith they have dwindles away Caleb stills the people and no doubt shouts out desperately as he sees the hope of Israel fading before him he shouts Verse 30. Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. And brethren and sisters. In the English. Th this verse isn't picked out very well for us. It's not translated very well for us. So we've put on the screen something to try to help us in that. So have a look carefully at the screen if you would. Where we read that Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Now do you see that in the Hebrew, what we have there are the same two words. So really, what that should read is, let us go, let us go. Go, go. That's what it should be saying to us. Go at once and possess it. For we are, and then look again in the Hebrew. We are well able to overcome. And do you see it's the same Hebrew word again? And really what that means is, we can! We can! And so as they're on the brink of the land, Caleb shouts out, Go! Go! At once and possess it. We can! We can! We've got our faith. You've got to prepare. Be prepared to do it, to step forward, to enter into the promised land. We read in our readings, didn't we, uh, just yesterday, so we won't go there, but of how kind and lovely God is. It was on Thursday, actually. That before they went into the land, under the hand of Joshua, before Moses even died, they defeated, didn't they, the last of the giants, Og, king of Bashan. They dealt with walls so high. And of course, when they came into the land, the first place they came to was Jericho. And there's a lovely lesson there, isn't there, for us? Because brethren and sisters, and young people, all of us have worries in our lives. All of us have things that try our faith, that challenge us. That are like stumbling blocks almost for us. And what God says to us in the example of Israel. Whatever your worries are. I'll deal with them for you. For them it was giants. It was walled villages. Whatever yours are. The Lord God of the heavens and the earth. The God of Israel. Will deal with your worries. For the Israelites in our chapter, they didn't have the faith to overcome. And so they're told 
Turn the page, chapter 14, verse 24. He says, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherewith he went, and his seed shall possess it. Halfway through verse 25. Tomorrow, turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Because they didn't have the faith. The next day, they had to turn. And they wandered again for 38 years. Come to Hebrews. Because in the letter to the Hebrews, we're given the most incredible commentary on this. As the Apostle Paul, we think, don't we? Wrote to the Hebrews. The Jewish men and women. He's exhorting them, as of course he's exhorting us. Go and have a look at Numbers chapter 13. Look what happened. And he quotes by the Spirit from Psalm 95, which we won't go to, but Psalm 95 picks up on this same theme. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit said, Today, if ye will hear his voice. Verse 15, verse 13 rather. Exhort one another daily while it's called today. Verse 15. Today, if you will hear his voice. Chapter 4, verse 7. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Brethren and sisters, young people, we live in the times when we're on the brink of the land. What are you doing today? Well, as it happens, you've made the right decision, right? But the challenge goes to us, doesn't it, every day? What are we doing today? Because if we don't take our chance, tomorrow we turn. And we go back to the wilderness to wander, to die out, to not inherit the land. And we're reminded at the end of chapter 3 of why they couldn't enter in. To whom swear he, verse 18, That they should not enter into his rest. But to them that believed not. Those who didn't have faith. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Because of a lack of faith. Let us therefore, and this is me and you. Let us therefore fear. Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as to them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We've got to make sure that the things we hear are mixed with faith. To ensure that we head in the right direction. To give ourselves every possible opportunity to head into that land into the promise of rest and we just note in verse 2 the principle that's important as brother mike said we can't ignore the old testament scriptures we can't ignore them to say well i'll just take the gospel i'll just take matthew mark luke and john thank you very much because to them verse 2 was the gospel preached our hope the gospel message is the hope of israel That's what the gospel is. The gospel is nothing new. The gospel is the hope of Israel. It's the fulfillment of the promises. Starting from Adam to Noah to Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. That's our hope. That, brethren and sisters and young people, is the gospel message. And so did the next generation enter into the rest. Did they go into the land? And enter the rest. Well they did go into the land didn't they? But they didn't enter the rest. Verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 4. For if Joshua, if Jesus, if Joshua obviously had given them rest. Then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth a rest to the people of God. Well 
the, 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 the other day that's being spoken of is by David in Psalm 95. Today, after so long a time, today if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Right? So David spoke of another rest. Therefore, it couldn't have been the rest that Joshua and the people, when they went into the land had. 4 verse 10, he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labour, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Come back, brothers and sisters, to a psalm of David, to Psalm 132, where David speaks as he's inspired to do, of the rest that will be given to the people of God. Psalm 132. We read from verse 8, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. Now, you note verse 16 that we've got almost a repetition of verse 9. But there's a difference. If we had time, I'd ask you to call it out. But let's just point it out. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. So in verse 9, the priests are clothed with righteousness. But actually, ultimately, they'll be clothed with salvation. They will be saved. And then we read in verse 9, Let thy saints shout for joy. And... The end of verse 16, her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Well, in the, in the Hebrew, what we read there is a repetition of what we've got in verse 9. So verse 9 says, let thy saints shout for joy. Verse 16 says, let thy saints shout for joy, shout for joy. Because they've been clothed with salvation. It's happened. They've been brought in to the land they've been brought into the rest and we keep reading verse 10 for thy servant david's sake turn not away the face of thine anointed the lord has sworn in truth to david he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body will i set upon thy throne if thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that i shall teach them their children shall also sit upon thy throne for evermore the lord has chosen zion He's desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Now, the end of verse 12, evermore, is forever, forever. Verse 14, this is my rest forever, forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless. I will bless, bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. And so the the blessing is given to David, to David and his seed. Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. David was to see a rest that the writer to the Hebrews picks up for us as we've seen together in Hebrews chapter 4. But we notice that there's a condition to the covenant. And we've tried to have a look to see if there's any structure in this psalm. And it's not easy to see, and I wouldn't be dogmatic about this. But obviously verse 9 and verse 16, we might suggest the book ends. And then we have the phrase, the Lord hath, the Lord hath. And then this phrase here, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. And this phrase here, their children shall also sit upon thy throne. And so we might suggest that perhaps in the middle, if thy children, will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them. That there's a condition, there's an if, in the centre of this psalm, right at the heart of it. And brethren and sisters, that same condition is there for us. That as Christadelphians, who we believe have been grafted in to the hope of Israel, to the olive tree of Israel, We need to understand that there are conditions, as there were for natural Israel, that we need to keep the covenant and the testimony that was taught to Israel, as has been taught to us 
through the pages of scripture. And so this psalm picks up a theme, doesn't it, of David in his great desire and love for God, wanting to bring the ark to Zion. And so we read just from the beginning of the psalm, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard it in a frater, we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles, we will worship at his footstool. So we heard it in Ephrata, Bethlehem Ephrata. Of course, it's David's birthplace, wasn't it? That's where David grew up, on the fields of Bethlehem. We heard it there. We heard that God wanted to, to bring it, the, the ark to Zion. We found it in the fields of the wood. Well, do, do you remember in the record in Samuel that after the Philistines captured the ark, it was taken, wasn't it, to kirjath Jirim, which means city of forests or city of woods. It's the same Hebrew word as we've got here, the wood. We found it in kirjath Jirim. We found it in the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill just outside of kirjath Jirim, in the fields of the wood. So come, come with me back to that record, to Samuel, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Where we read of God choosing David. And he chose him because he was a man, wasn't he, after God's own heart. And we're told in chapter 16 and verse 1 that the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Well, why was he rejected? Just turn back a page. Chapter 15, verse 23. Samuel told him, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. Verse 26. For you rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Saul was rejected... Because he rejected the word of the Lord. Brethren and sisters, is the word of the Lord central in our lives? If the one who was set up to be the first king of Israel could be rejected because he didn't allow the word to be the centre of his life, then we're in serious trouble, aren't we? If we don't ensure that the word of the Lord is at the centre of our lives. So how does that affect us practically? In our homes, with our children, with our grandchildren. We may have no children, but there are plenty of children running around in this meeting room today. And they're your children. They're my children. They're the heritage of the Lord. If the Lord Jesus Christ remains away, they are the lampstand. Our role is to ensure that that generation have got the word of God inside them. Now the cynics amongst you may well just think, Pete, we note that you have four children and clearly you don't want the responsibility of looking after them, right? But brethren and sisters, the Lord has set us in a family. He set us in ecclesias that we might support and look after each other to hold fast to the word of the Lord. That's why it went wrong for Saul. Let's make sure it never goes wrong for us for that reason. And so David is chosen. We're told in chapter 16, verse 1. Fill your horn with oil and go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And of course, Samuel presumes as soon as he sees Eliab, 
this strapping man, that of course it must be him. But, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. A key principle for us, isn't it, as Christadelphians? So what was it about David then that God loved so much that this man was chosen, the one who was in the fields keeping the sheep, that he was chosen by God to be his king. That God who was so let down by the fact that the people, he said to Samuel, have not rejected you, they've rejected me. He was the king of Israel. But God was prepared to choose this man to sit on his throne. We might suggest there were two reasons. The first we've seen in Psalm 132. That David was, had his mind set on Zion. He wanted to get to Zion. He wanted to dwell with God in Zion. But we might also suggest that it's in the harpist of Israel, the sweet psalmist of Israel. We're told in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and you don't need to turn there, the the verses for you uh, on the screen. That this David, who was the sweet psalmist of Israel, says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. His word was in my tongue. Of course, it was inspired to be in his tongue. But what made David special was that he was utterly in tune with God. His word was on his tongue. And brethren and sisters, that's what it needs to be for us. The word needs to be on our tongue. That's why David was chosen above all the sons of Jesse. To be the king. And so many years later. He's able to bring the ark to Zion. Just come to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Well we just want to note. Two very quick things. One is that the ark was brought from the house of Abinadab. Which of course we know was in Kirjath Jirim, the fields of the wood. There's our connection from Psalm 132. And we also notice in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that when David successfully, after the first attempt, is able to bring the ark to Zion, he does so and he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who of course was the first king of Salem. So we see the importance of Jerusalem in the plan and the purpose of God. That David here is able to be a king priest as he points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so David, this man who was a man after God's own heart, who so wanted the ark to be in Zion, wanted to build for God a house, and God said, no, it's not so. You've been a man of war. It wouldn't be suitable for you to build an ark. Your son will build an ark. Your your son, rather, will build the temple. And so David is given these promises. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, and when you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. Now, Brother Mike's already made the point for us. The seed is singular. I will set up thy seed after thee. One person. Which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. So we we see that we absolutely clearly. That David is told. When you're dead. When you're dead. And you're lying in a grave. And you're dead. I will set up. Your seed after you. He will be of your line. And he will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom 
forever. Verse 15, but verse 16, and your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you. And so in these promises, in this first principle, we see the most remarkable prophecy. Because this isn't just a kingdom that's going to last forever when you're dead. This is a kingdom that's going to be set up after you've died, but that you are going to see forever. It's going to be established before you. Your throne will be established forever. In verse 16, your house and your throne shall be made sure forever. These are the sure mercies of David. And so in the first place, the Israel of the day might have been looking to Solomon as the fulfilment of the promises given to David. And brethren and sisters, of course, we know, we shall spend little time on it, that Solomon was but a fulfilment, an anticipatory fulfilment of the promises that, were going, that had been given to David. Just quickly turn, just for a refresher in our minds, to these references for us to make this point. First Chronicles chapter 29. We just want to pick up one verse that makes clear to us that this throne isn't about David or Solomon. This throne is about Yahweh. This throne is the God of Israel's. Verse 23 of 1 Chronicles 29. Solomon sat on the throne of Yahweh as king instead of David his father and prospered and all Israel obeyed him. This is an absolutely critical principle that we understand. That the throne is the throne of Yahweh's. The hope of Israel is about Yahweh as king. They rejected him. And when after the millennium period, God is made all in all, the Lord Jesus Christ will hand the kingdom to Yahweh. The throne is Yahweh's and has always been. 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Queen of Sheba can see. Verse 8. Bless be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne to be king. For the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever, therefore made he thee king over them to do judgment and justice. And so Solomon becomes this great type. Just come to 1 Kings chapter 4. He is this incredible type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he is not the one. Verse 21. Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistine to the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. Psalm 72 will no doubt be in your margin as the kings bring presents. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal. Ten fat oxen, twenty oxen out of the pastures, and a hundred sheep beside harts and roebucks, and fallow deer and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the rain on this side of the river, from Tifsuf even to Azar, of all the kings on this side of the river. He had peace on all sides round about him, and Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. What a reign! What a reign Solomon's was! They lacked nothing, we read at the end of verse 27. They lacked nothing. And even what's a rather lovely point is that Solomon was given so much wisdom and understanding, verse 29, exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that's on the seashore. Well, look at verse 20. 
Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude. He had as much wisdom as he needed for all the people he governed. As the sand on the seashore. And so what it shows us in this extraordinary type of the kingdom is that even the best of men, even men who are given wisdom beyond measure, even the wisest man, after of course the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever lived could not deliver a kingdom. They could not do it. And so it shows us a principle that even the best of men couldn't deliver a kingdom that was acceptable before Yahweh. A man was needed who would not forsake his law, who would not walk in their own judgments, who would not break the statutes of the Almighty, but who would keep his commandments. And so the reference on the screen there, which we won't go to because of time, in 1 Kings chapter 11, we see that Solomon was not the seed of David. He would not be the one who would sit on the throne forever. <coughs> the one would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brethren and sisters, for the sake of time, we're going to very quickly go to Psalm 89 that we read together. Psalm 89, we read of the covenant, the promise that God gave to David. And we see in verse 30 that once again there's a condition. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed will endure forever, his throne as the sun before me. It will be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in the heavens. Now, that word faithful, in verse 37 is the same Hebrew word as the one stand fast, fast, in verse 28. And it's the Hebrew word sure. Isaiah 55, the sure mercies of David. They're the faithful mercies. They're mercies that will stand fast. And it's a chapter that we need to go to. Come to Isaiah chapter 55. This extraordinary chapter. It's a linchpin, perhaps, in Scripture. And we see that these mercies are for everyone. Verse 1 of Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk. Genesis 49. Without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently. Listen, listen, it means, to me. Eat ye that which is good, and lest your, let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, with everyone, even the sure mercies of David that throne that's going to be established forever the one that David is going to see established before him even though he's dead and buried that covenant is given to you and to me if we have faith in these things and so we read on verse 5 seek ye the Lord while he may be found Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. and He will have mercy upon him. To our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Why is it that God's ways are not our ways? That his thoughts are not our thoughts? Why are they so much higher than ours? The end of verse 7. For he will abundantly pardon. There is the hope of Israel. For he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that so lovely? Isn't that so lovely? That you and I, who this week will go about our daily lives if the Lord remains away, and we can know of a certainty, it is sure, it's fast, it's certain, that the Lord will pardon us abundantly if we have faith in the sure mercies of David. I'm going to keep us going how are we doing for time have I got till quarter past four just about yeah 13 minutes past four right okay give me the wink at 13 minutes past well we'd like to just study together Isaiah 55 with John chapter 7 because in John chapter 7 we see that the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills the characteristics of the one who can offer the sure mercies of David. So, we've got on our screen to help us here just a few links that are very obvious between these two chapters. We read in John chapter 7, verse 37, If any man thirst, the Lord Jesus calls out, Let him come to me and drink. Well, I'm sure you've got in your margin there. Isaiah 55, verse 1. The point we want to make there, if anybody, everyone, can take of this blessing. We, we, We read together in verse 37 that the Lord wants them to come to me. Isaiah 55, verse 3. Come to me. We read in verse 42 that... He, that some of the context here is that they're looking for someone who is of the seed of David. Well, we're not surprised, are we? Because that's what the mer- sure mercies of David are about. One who is going to be of the seed of David. We read in verse 34, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Where will he go? Where will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said? Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. We didn't read together in Isaiah 55, verse 11. Which reads, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to be void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So we see in verse 33. Then said Jesus to them, Ye, yet a little while am I with you. And then I go to him that sent me. And then our final link that we see. Uh, In verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Ye shall seek me and not find me. So I notice is a repeat of one we have two back. Which no doubt all of you have seen for the last five minutes. But it's critical isn't it? Because you'll see, this is why I did it brethren and sisters. Look in verse 34. There's a repetition in verse 36. Of course I did it on purpose. Well, we want to note something else here. The the, the context of this chapter. John 7 verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the reason I'm showing you that verse is because I think it's interesting that in the middle of verse 34 and 36 where you've got this phrase repeated the the jews asked 
whether or not he was going to go, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles <coughs> and teach the Gentiles. That was the question that they had in their minds. So we need to keep that question in mind, our minds a second. We note in verse 1 that the Lord Jesus would not walk in Jewry. Moreover, we're also told in verse 10 that when the disciples had gone to Jerusalem to keep the feast, that the Lord went up also to the feast, but not openly. He went, as it were, in secret. So the Lord was not prepared to walk any more openly with the Jews. In fact, he wasn't prepared to show his face any more to the Jews. And the people asked, what's this about? Seek, seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Is he going to go to the Gentiles? Come to Isaiah chapter 6. Where we see a vision, which, interestingly, we sang in our first hymn. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And this vision, in the year that King Isaiah died, is shown, he sees a vision of the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The train being the, the Hebrew word there for a priestly garment. So we've got here a king priest we know it's the Lord Jesus Christ, because look in your margin, it's cited in John chapter 12, verse 41. We shall go there very quickly, if we have time, shortly. But look at what he sees in vision. Above it stood the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings he covered his face. With two wings he covers his feet. And with two wings he did fly. John chapter 7. The Lord Jesus would not walk any more openly. With two wings he covers his feet. He chose to, to hide himself, to, to, to not be open, but as it were in secret. With two wings he covers his face. And with two wings he did fly. Where is he flying? The salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. Just quickly see Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11. In the days of Isaiah, the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me, I should not walk in the way of this people. Verse 17. I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob. You see, John chapter 7, the sure mercies of David, is showing to us that the forgiveness of sins is for everyone. Just come to John chapter 12. Just the last few minutes of our talk. John chapter 12. John chapter 12 picks up from Isaiah 6, verse 40. He's blinded their eyes. He's talking of Israel. Harden their heart, lest they should see with their eyes and understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. Isaiah chapter 6. Well, just have a look. Isaiah chapter, John chapter 11, verse 54. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews. With two wings, he covers his feet. John chapter 12, verse 36. Halfway through, these things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. With two wings, he covers his face. Because the gospel message was not just for Israel. This nation that was chosen to be a witness to God for all time was supposed to be a witness. But the gospel message was always for everyone. And so, we note verse 32 of John 12. If I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Verse 47. If any man Hear my words and do them. Well, come to Acts chapter 28. Because Acts chapter 28. We have the time when the Apostle Paul. 
is desperately trying to reason with the Jews. Verse 17, we read, It came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Here he is in Rome. He's bound by chains. And when they were come together, he said to the men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem to the hand of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. <coughs> but when the Jews spake against me, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. And so he goes on. And they meet again on another day, verse 23. And he speaks to these Jews to try to convince them. And some of them believe and some of them don't. And the ones who don't, he quotes verse 26 and 27 from Isaiah chapter 6. And he says at verse 28, Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God, Isaiah, is sent to the Gentiles and they will also hear it. And so, brethren and sisters, it would make sense for us to go to Romans 11 here. Our time has gone and Brother Mike has banned me from going to Romans 11. But we understand, don't we, that these mercies, the sure mercies of David, are given to us because of what happened to Israel. And yet Israel has not been rejected. Through the rest of the kingdom of Israel, we see glimpses of the kingdom age before ultimately it falls. In Ezekiel chapter 21, we won't turn there. We recall, don't we? What was said to Zedekiah, the profane, wicked prince of Israel. That God would overturn, overturn, overturn. And it shall be no more. There will not be a monarch in Israel. And of course, what an extraordinary prophecy that is. That here in 2017, there is still no monarch in Israel. And there never will be. Until Shiloh comes. Until he come, whose right it is. And unto him will the obedience of the people be. Brethren and sisters, do you pray for Shiloh? Do you pray for him to come, whose right it is? We see the hope of Israel through the prophets. We could go to all these prophecies. Because Israel have not been rejected. They've not been cut off. They're still part of the promises. Rather extraordinary. Benjamin Netanyahu, when speaking to the United Nations General Assembly in September 2013, quotes from one of these prophecies. He quotes from Amos chapter 9. Just have a look at this. In our time, In our time the biblical prophecies, prophecies are being are realized. Being realized. As the prophet Amos said, they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall till gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. Veshavti etshvut ami Yisrael. ובנו ערים נשמות וישבו, ונטו כרמים ושתו את יינם, ועשו גינות ואכלו את פריים, ונתתים על אדמתם, ולא ינטשו עוד. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Israel have come home never to be uprooted again. No wonder the prophet Isaiah says, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. And he says, Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Where can that happen today? It happens in the United Nations 
General Assembly building. And in 2013, the God of the heavens and the earth, the God of Israel, puts in front of all the nations of the world one who's prime minister in Israel. And he says, you are my witnesses. And he gets him to quote from Amos chapter 9. Maybe the angels were involved in writing the script. That you and me might see that Israel are still central to the plan and the purpose of God. Not that we agree with everything that Israel does. Whether for good or for bad, they are God's witnesses. Very quickly, brethren and sisters. Penultimate slide. Netanyahu, on the Holocaust Remembrance Day, in 2015, talks of the challenges in the world. And he finishes by quoting from Isaiah. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Well, where's he quoted from? Where's that from? Excellent. Isaiah 62, right? For Zion's sake, what should we do? If we see this, if we see this man who's been put on this forum for all the world to see, quoting from Isaiah, keep reading. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, his glory shall be seen upon thee. The Gentiles shall come to thy light, the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they that gather themselves together shall come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. That word nursed, it's the only other time that it's used as the word nursed. It's the word sure. The sure mercies of David. We're seeing the sure mercy of David begin to be fulfilled in our time as the people have been brought back to the land. And so finally, brethren and sisters, just come to Ezekiel chapter 39. Which, of course, is a prophecy that has not been fulfilled in any way. It's a prophecy that will be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Verse 25. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous of my holy name. And that they have borne their shame, after that they've borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they trespass against me, when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I've brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, they shall know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I've gathered them to their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I've poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So brethren and sisters, if we can, we'd like to take four things away. We need to understand that the kingdom of Israel was a shadow of the kingdom which is to come. We need to understand that Israel are still at the very heart, the centre of God's plan and purpose with the world. We need to recognise that the Gentiles, you and I, have been taken out by faith to be grafted in to the promises given to the fathers. And so, as we stand here, surely, at a time in history, when we are so near the land. We can almost see it. It's coming into view. The Lord Jesus Christ is soon going to come back. Caleb's cry goes up to us. We can, we can go 
go. We've got to do our utmost by faith to inherit that land. 